Hello, good, good afternoon, everyone. Sorry, I'm in the I'm doing some sort of high flex up, so I'm just talking to the people that's in the meeting currently through Zoom. Uh, so give me roughly uh, five minutes just to set up the uh, my high flex situation. Yeah, <laughs> just give me about five minutes to set up my high flex situation. Uh, please note that uh, when I do have it set up, my camera is going to be turned off. Um, only because of the fact that I share the screen through my iPad to go through the work. So that's why. That's for me. that on. Now I just need a couple of charges. Uh, again, I'm going to set up an attendance group um, to decide. Uh, I'm going to do it while we're after I get sentenced. I'm going to do it I'll pass that on.
need another outlet. This bypass. No, I got to be close to this one. That's why the room is focused. It's not set up for high flex at all. Where's my back lights? Oh, shit. So short. I can't use this for uh, to connect all the outlets together. So I'm going to be on one side, opposite side. I'm sorry, man. I'm going to try my best. I can't, I can't move the laptop from where, where I am because I need to connect both. Um, I need to be connected to the outlets. Unfortunately, I can't disconnect that other one. All right, everyone, whoever's here, I'm going to try my best to speak as loud as I can. Um, but I'll be on the other side of the room. I'm turning off my uh, share screen. Can I get a little closer? Nope. Uh, let's see. One second. Hopefully you guys uh, can hear me. Sorry for the, uh, probably the double voices. Okay, so let's begin. Sorry for all the uh, technical difficulties. Um, I wanna go through uh, our very first review session for math uh, 171 slash 172. How many of you are uh, in uh, during this meeting out here uh, in person? How many of you are in 171? 171? Uh, so it looks like almost everybody's here for 171 rather than 172. Okay, so I just wanna give you guys a heads up, basically the directions for our uh, first review session. So, the purpose of review session number one is to prepare students uh, for their upcoming examination uh, in either Math 171 or 172. Uh, during review session number one, we will discuss and explain uh, how to solve uh, problems in the following topics. So there are three main areas, the distance formula and circles, that's number one. Number two is lines, where we look at the slope, the different equations used to talk about uh, pertaining to lines and their graphs. And lastly, we're gonna look at functions. Uh, alge it's algebra, it, uh, limited domains of some functions and also their graphs. Please note that the problems that I have highlighted in yellow um, are examples similar to problems that you will see again on the final exam, okay? So any problem number that's highlighted Please make a mental note of it because the fact that it's a similar type of example um, you'll be you'll see again for your final, okay? Whether it's 171 or 172. So let's get started. Problem number one states: find the distance between two ordered pairs. Uh, they are negative four, negative one, and two comma negative three. 
if necessary, express the final answer uh, in simplified radical form. So how do we find the distance between two points? Do anybody know uh, what formula would I use here? Yep. That's right. I am going to use the distance formula. What is your name, by the way? Marwin. You were in my, my, yeah, yeah, okay, I remember you, Marwin. So we have the distance formula. And the distance formula states that D is equal to what? Does anybody remember what the distance formula states? Yeah, what is that symbol called? I saw you draw it with your fingers. Say it. Yeah, that's the square root. There you go. So it's equal to the square root of what? What goes inside our square root? Oh, Mike, you can tell us. Thank you, Mike. Inside of the square root is x square, uh, x two minus x one squared plus y two minus y one square. All right, so we're going to, you can label your values from your ordered pair. You can say that's x1, y1, x2, y2, substitute it into your formula, and then simplify as much as possible. So what we're going to have is d is equal to the square root of uh, the difference in the x values. So 2 minus negative 4 squared plus uh, negative three minus negative one squared. And we're gonna have to simplify this. Uh, so what's two minus negative four? Anybody know what's two minus negative four? It turns into a positive, that's right. The two, that's gonna be two plus four. So what's two plus four? Six. So we have the square root of six squared plus negative three minus negative one. What's negative three minus negative one? Careful, because if you apply your keep change change, that's negative three plus one. So what's, there you go. Thank you, Mike. Negative three uh, plus one is negative two. So we have negative two squared. Alrighty, what is uh, six squared? 36. 36, that's right. And what is negative two squared? Four. Four, that's right. 36 plus four? 40. 40. So we get these equal to the square root of 40. Now, this is a good answer, but the question states that uh, if necessary, express your answer in simplified radical form. If you want to simplify a radical like radical 40 or square root of 40, you have to think of the factors of 40 where one of them is a perfect square other than the number one. So is there a number, is there a factor of 40 that's a perfect square, yeah? Four, four the square root of four is, is actually going to be one. Two, right? So four is a, is a perfect square number, square root of four is two. All right, so we have to write it out as a product. We have to break it down. It's going to be the square root of four times, well, the square root of something else, but four times what gives you 40? 10. So inside the second radical, you write out square root of 10. And now you simplify it. Square root of four is two. So you're going to get two square root of 10. And that will be your final answer only because the fact that 10. The, the factors of 10 are, are 1, 2, 5, and 10. Other than the number 1, 2, 5, and 10 are not perfect squares. You had a question? That's right. There, there's other factors that goes into these, uh, the number 40. However, uh, the only thing is if you unmute any time to ask me any questions, I can't possibly hear you. Give me a heads up. Um, but yes, if, if, um, if you look at the square root of 40, there, there are, there, there are other factors of 40, 
Um, so for example, if you want to write out all the factor pairs, you have four and 10, that's the one that we chose, one and 40, two and uh, 20, five and eight. The one that works the best for us here is four and 10 because four is automatically, you already know that's already a perfect square. Okay. The, the number 20 and, and eight, for example, you would have had to keep continually break that down until you get to four. All right, any questions to problem number one? Let me just look at the uh, chat real quick. So I can look at this thing. Yep, you got it right, right? So I turn the volume here. I turn the volume here. So hopefully I can hear you guys. Hello, good afternoon. Is it okay to move on to the next problem? Yeah, go ahead. Well, well the, if you look at 10, the factors of 10 are one, two, five, and 10. But other than the number one, is two, five, and 10 uh, are, are two, five, and 10 perfect squares? No, I'm actually, no, they're not perfect squares. So you can leave it as square root of 10. The square root of four is, is your two, right? So, I'm bad. Square root of four is two, so that's why you get two square root of 10 as a final answer. You can't simplify nor break this down any further. You're welcome. That's right, Mike. Square root of 10 cannot be simplified. Okay. Uh, are we okay to continue? All right, let's look at problem number two now. So problem number two asks us to write the standard form of the equation of the circle with the center negative three, five, and the radius is three. So in this problem, if you want to write the standard form of the equation of the circle, you need to know your formulas. So what is the equation of the circle? Anybody? Can you repeat that one more time? R squared. Mm, not quite. There you go, X minus H squared plus. That's right. So the equation of the circle is, I'll write it this way, X minus H squared plus y minus k squared is equal to r squared. Okay, do anybody remember what r stands for? Radius, right? So r is the radius. And what does the h and k stand for? The center point, right? So h comma k is actually an order pair. h comma k is the center point. And of course, X and Y are actually points that lies on, on the circle. Okay, so we just got to use the following characteristics here. We're given the sensor, given the radius. We just plug things in and then simplify. So with the sensor being negative uh, three comma five, you can label the values of H and K. What is the value of H and K? Say again? Yes, but what is the value of H? Let's start with that. Is it three or negative three? That's right. H is negative three, whereas K is gonna be five. Now the radius, we have R is equal to three. In our formula, just remember that we have to do R squared. So if R is equal to three, that implies that R squared 
is equal to three raised to the second power. And what is three raised to the second power? Nine. So now we're gonna insert our center and the value of R squared. What we're gonna get is X minus negative three squared plus Y minus five, that's the value of K squared is equal to nine. Now, if you look at X minus negative three squared, can you simplify that just a tiny bit? Yeah? That's right. It will be X plus three to the second power plus Y minus five to the second power, which is equal to nine. And that would be your solution to problem number two. Writing the equation uh, of the circle, looking at the given characteristics, which are your center point and the value of R. Just be mindful if H or K turns out to be a negative uh, coordinate, then when you insert it into the formula, uh, the signs will change, right? Like for example, X minus negative three, that became X plus three. So just be mindful of that because you'll, you'll see that often with my lab, with the negative numbers, when it turns actually to simplify certain things. I have a question. Sounds good. Welcome, by the way. Um, I have Don't a worry, I'll get, I'll get the attendance soon. Um, let me just look at the chat. Sorry, Robert, I missed that question. No, I cannot hear the question. I can't hear it. I can, I can barely hear the students that are speaking. Um, in person. Yes, you can write the three as three squared, uh, but three squared does simplify the nine. So that hence why uh, uh, on the side I said R is equal to three, followed by, okay, if R is equal to three, then formulate that to be R squared, that's three to the second power, which is nine. I inserted it, that value into the formula. Rafael, if can and you kindly answer some of the questions. It's it's a uh, somewhat difficult for you to go back and forth. Okay, so that is problem number two. I'm going to move on to problem three. Sounds good. We're all good. So problem three is is pretty much very similar to what we did in problem two. It states, uh, give the center and the radius of the circle described by the equation. So the equation that's given to us is x plus four squared um, plus y plus five squared is equal to 36. So remember the equation in its standard form is x minus h squared plus y minus uh, K squared is equal to R squared. You have to give the center point and you have to give your radius. So if you look at the, the, the way that the standard form of, of the equation of the circle is compare it to what's given, there's a little bit of rewrite that we have to do before we give our center point, uh, before we give the center point. Do anybody see uh, something that's a little bit different with the given equation versus the formula? What does the given equation contain that the formula doesn't or vice versa? What looks a little bit different? That's right, Mike. The negatives were, um, were turned into positive values, right? In the given equation, you have a positive four and a positive five. You can actually convert that to represent the values of H and K, but more importantly, resemble the equation of the circle. Uh, all you can do, right, if you think about it, if you want to turn a positive four, for example, into a negative four, then how can you do, how can you turn that positive four into a negative four? Yeah? Multiply by a negative one. That's right. And when you multiply by negative one, uh, negative one times negative four, that's just positive four. Similarly, if I had positive five, that's equal to negative one 
times negative five. So when I rewrite this, just note also that, um, do I always have to write that one next to the negative? No, you could just say negative of negative four and negative of negative five, All right? So this will give us the following equation, x minus negative four squared plus y minus negative five squared. And that's now gonna equal to r squared. Well, if r squared is equal to 36, then what is the value of r? r is gonna equal to what? Six, right? You take the square root on both sides. All right, so I'm just writing it out where you should be able to identify now h, k, and r, right? So we found r on the side, but I just showed you what it looks like when you simplify the formula a bit. So with all that being said, our center point for problem number three will be what? Negative four, negative five, and the radius, the radius, which is the value of r is equal to six. And that are your answers for problem three. Uh, we are multiplying by negative four and negative five, so that way I can rewrite the given equation uh, using the formula. If you look at the formula closely, it states x minus h, y minus k. So if you have a positive four, positive four is the same thing as saying negative one times negative four. That allows me to rewrite x plus four as x minus negative four. And the same thing can be said with y plus five. Uh, you can rewrite that now as y minus negative five. That's what helps us to find, figure out what's the set of the No, I need that. Okay. By the way, I'm passing out the attendance book. Thank you. Okay, so that's problem three. We're ready to move on. So I think we just finished the first part. That was on distance formula and line uh, circles. Now we're going to spend a bulk of time talking about lines. We're going to look at all the different type of formulas and the way that you can represent them using different uh, two different equations and of course their graph. So problem four states the following. We're gonna write an equation for the line in both point slope form and slope intercept form. If the line is passing through two points, negative two, negative five, six, and negative five. So with all that being said, we're gonna need three things. One, I need a formula that will help me calculate the slope. Two, I need to know what's the point slope form. And three, I need to know what's the slope intercept form. So I'm just gonna write them out here on the side, formulas that you need to know. Oh, sorry, not a heart there. Let's put a circle. Okay, so first thing is the slope. What letter, by the way, do you use to represent the slope? Let's begin with that. M, that's right. So how do you compute the slope? What is the formula state? Yeah? The change in Y over change in X. Um, and if you actually want to show, interpret that with the coordinates, right? Uh, using uh, the coordinates, Y2, Y1, X2, X1, then all you need to do is just put a minus sign between them, right? So the change in Y can be represented by saying Y2 minus Y1 over X2, minus x1. So that's one formula that you are gonna to need to know, the slope formula. Second thing that we need to know is the point slope formula. Anybody know what's the point slope form?
m times uh, m times x in parentheses x minus x one. You got it. Very good. So it's y minus y one equals m times x minus x one. Yep. And the third thing that we're going to need is the slope intercept. So the slope intercept form is what? Mm hmm. What does M stand for? Well, M stands for the slope. Sorry. Uh, what does B stand for? The y-intercept. That's right. So when we're going to look at the graphing in terms of graphing linear equations, we're not going to do it for this particular problem, but we're going to come back and look at the slope form when we want to talk about the value of B, which is, again, the y-intercept. All right. So we're going to apply these three formulas in exactly how it's ordered. First, calculate the slope, then use the point slope formula, and then lastly, uh, rewrite the point slope formula as the slope intercept form y equals mx plus b. For such a large room, these chairs are very tiny. Okay. Uh, so, if you want to compute your slope, you can go ahead and label your two points. You can say this is your x1, y1, x2, y2. And then use some direct substitution. So we're going to get negative 5 um, plus, sorry, negative 5 minus negative 5 over 6 minus negative 2. All right, let's work this out. What's negative 5 minus negative 5? Can I rewrite it in a way to simplify the arithmetic? Say it again. No, that's negative five minus uh, negative five. Yeah? That's right. You can rewrite this as negative five plus five. And then you have six minus negative two. So six minus uh, negative two, you can also rewrite that as what? Six plus two. Yep. Okay. Now let's work out the, the arithmetic. What's negative five plus five? Zero. Six plus two. Eight, zero divided by eight, zero. You wanna pass this in? Maybe he wants to sign the book. So you get zero over eight is zero. All right, so the slope here is zero. What does that tell us about the line? By the way, what type of line do we deal with when the slope is zero? That's right, when M is equal to zero, you're dealing with a horizontal line. So actually for this problem, um, I could actually do the graph because the graph would be pretty easy. Horizontal line is just a line that runs straight. Uh, it's a constant line um, where it runs from left to right. It's just, it's just one horizontal line. Okay. Uh, all right. So now we do the point slope form. Well, when we apply the point slope form, y minus y1 equals m times x minus x1, does it matter which order pair I use? No, it does not. It does not matter which order pair you use. So go ahead. Uh, you can use the first one or the second order pair. Uh, let's just say I use the second order pair, okay? I'll leave the first one as an exercise for you guys. Uh, but let's say we did the second one. Um, we have y minus negative five equals the slope, which is zero, times x minus six. Again, I'm using the second uh, order pair. Um, and we're gonna work this out. Um, on that left-hand side of the equation, uh, you can simplify it just a tad bit, right? So y minus negative five is what? Y plus five. So you're gonna get y plus five equals zero times x minus six. So you don't quote me on this. You might actually have to practice this problem on my lab, but when you write your answer in point slope form, not slope intercept, but point slope form, and it asks you to simplify it, this might be the final answer for that part, okay? For the point slope formula, y plus five equals zero times x minus six, that might possibly be the final answer. But now, the additional step is to complete this problem is to actually write it in slope intercept form. So we take the equation that I put the box in, and we're gonna just simply solve for y.
if you want to solve for y, this will allow us to write the equation in slope intercept form. Okay, there's two steps. One, you first distribute the slope, which is zero, inside of the parentheses. But some, we have some good news here. What happens when you take zero times x uh, minus six? That's all going to be what? Zero, any number times zero is zero. So I put a big fat zero there. Uh, and then, of course, we just have the right-hand side of the equation, y plus 5 equals 0. And if you want to solve for y, what do you do to both sides of the equation? Now you've got to subtract 5 on both sides. So we have the equation, now y equals negative 5. And that will be your equation in slope-intercept form. Again, because the fact that your slope was 0, right, just writing it out with the slope of 0, you have this equation, y equals zero x minus five. But zero times any other number is always what? Zero, so zero minus five. Careful, zero minus five. Negative five, right? So this is y equals zero minus five, which is y equals negative five. Hence, y equals negative five is in slope intercept form. More importantly, any time you're dealing with a horizontal line, two things happen. The slope is always zero, but the equation of that line is always in the form of y equals b, whatever the y-intercept is. So in this equation, what is your y-intercept for problem four? Negative five, right? So just a quick visual. I do it on the top here. Uh, let's see. Um, actually, let me just erase this part. Now draw a tiny graph. So here's my y-axis, here's my x-axis. Now, um, I'm basically looking at the y-intercept zero, negative five. So I'm just doing this by uh, freehandedly, so it's a rough sketch. Let's say that this order pair is the y-intercept shown in blue. The horizontal line, um, y equals negative five, is shown in red. For any value of x, the y-value is always negative five. Any questions to problem four? See that chat. See the I think you left question. And good work to those that were participating in the chat. I didn't even, I wasn't, I wasn't looking because I'm looking at the iPad screen rather than uh, the laptop. Anybody have any questions here from the in-person? Any questions? Yeah? That's right. We're gonna get there, we're getting there. Don't worry, this, was, this one wasn't actually too bad to do, to draw, but we're gonna get there. I'm gonna get there actually with problem five and six, okay? So let's look at problem five, shall we? Problem five states, given the linear equation, four X plus six Y um, is uh, plus 12 is equal to zero, find the X intercept, the Y intercept, and the slope. Then, oops, what's up with my iPad? It doesn't charge. It's charged. Okay, I'm back. Uh, so find the x, y uh, intercepts, the slope, then use this information to sketch the graph of the linear equation. Again, we're doing a sketch. So my sketch might come out a little, I'm doing a freehand. So it might look like uh, a little, uh, not, not perfectly straight. It's like going to the barber shop and you accidentally made one side a little bit. Uh, you, you push back one side by accident. You know? It happens, especially during the pandemic. I know it happens to some of you guys. You know, try to do your own hairline and you push back back by accident. It happens. Okay. So, um, how do we find the X and Y intercepts? Let's begin with that. In general, how would you find that? Yeah. Um, that's if you want to write the linear equation 
in y equals mx plus b form yet. Uh, y equals mx plus b form. We're not there yet. I want to know algebraically, how can we find the x and y intercepts? Yeah? That's right. For the, for the x intercept, you have to set y equals to zero, and you will have to solve for what? If we replace y with zero, what, what variable are we going to solve for? X. Solve for x, that's right. And let's look at finding the y-intercept algebraically. Uh, to find the y-intercept algebraically, what do we set equal to zero? Say it again. Set x equals to zero, and then solve for You solve for y, you solve for the other variable, right? You, you, you're replacing one variable with zero and then you solve for the other. Okay, and if you wanna get the uh, slope of this line, by the way, um, just note that this equation of the, uh, your linear equation here, is it written in slope intercept form? No, so to find the slope, you, have, you would have to rewrite the equation in terms of y, that's why you, that's why you mentioned to isolate y. So I'll do that uh, after I find both of these intercepts. Okay, so for the x-intercept, I'm gonna replace y with zero and solve for x. So this equation becomes four x plus six times zero plus 12 is equal to zero. Now, the good news is when we replace y with zero, what happens to six times zero? It's what? It's zero, it basically goes away. Okay, so now we're just left with 4x plus 12 is equal to zero. How can I get x by itself? Subtract uh, first 12 on both sides. So this is 4x equals to negative 12. Then how do I get x by itself? divide by four. So I'm only, because I'm running out of room, I'm not showing the exact steps, but I'm saying it in words. First, we subtract 12 on both sides, and then we divide by four. So we're gonna get X equals negative four over 12. Uh, sorry, negative four, sorry, negative 12 over four, my apologies. And negative four, uh, negative 12 over four, when we reduce it, is gonna be what? Negative three. Very good. So if X is equal to negative three, Right, for your x-intercept, you can write it as an order of pair. That order of pair is gonna be what? Negative three, that's the value of x, comma, the value of zero, which was y. Okay, so we got our x-intercept. Let's get the y-intercept. So for the y-intercept, go ahead, replace uh, x equals with zero. So this becomes four times zero plus six y equals 12. Uh, sorry, plus 12 is equal to zero. So what's four times zero? Zero, yes, that will go away since that's zero. Uh, now we're just left with the six y plus 12 equals zero. Okay, um, what do I do next? How do I get y by itself? Subtract 12 on both sides. This becomes 6y equals negative 12. And how do you get y by itself? What's the last thing to do? Divide by six. So if we divide by six, we get y equals negative 12 over six, which is negative two. And as an order pair, you can write the y-intercept as well. Zero, negative two. Okay, good. We have two order pairs. When you're sketching the graph of a linear equation, all you need is two points that lies on that line. Um, those two points, namely that we have here are very specific. It's when the graph crosses the X and Y intercepts, which are perfect. Now, all we need to do is just figure out what is the slope of this line, and then we'll make our sketch. So let's look back at that given equation. The given equation was, 4x plus 6y plus 12 is equal to zero. 
you're going to rewrite this equation in y equals mx plus b form by isolating y, uh, so that way you can get the slope. Uh, so first thing is, what can I do? What should I move first? Move the 12. So here I can subtract 12 on both sides. If I subtract the 12, this becomes 4x plus 6y equals negative 12. Okay, is there anything else that I can do here? You're gonna subtract the 4x next on both sides. So if I subtract the 4x on both sides, the 4x will cancel on the left. You're just left with 6y equals negative 4x. I usually like to write the variable term first, minus the 12. Okay, now how do we get y by itself? We're gonna divide by six. Now, when we're gonna divide by six on both sides, the terms on the right, since there were two of them, I'm dividing both of those terms by six. And we're gonna simplify. So the six on the left will cancel. That will give us y again by itself there. Uh, what's negative four over six when you reduce it? Negative two thirds. So it's negative two over three times x and negative 12 minus six, negative two. From this equation, you, from the slope intercept form, you should definitely be able to identify its slope and the y-intercept, right? The y-intercept, let's start with that first. Where was the y, what was the y-intercept? Ne negative two. Does that correlate to what we found algebraically? Yes, b is definitely negative two. What is the value of m? That's right, m is equal to negative two thirds. Now look at the sign of your slope. Your sign of your slope is what? Negative. What does that imply about your line? The line should be going down. So in quotes, I'm just gonna make reference that when I do sketch this graph, the line is decreasing from left to right. Typically when you read graphs, uh, you read it from left to right. So yes, the line is decreasing. So what I'm gonna do, I ran out of room. Um, so I'm just gonna squeeze it in here. So here's your y axis. Here's your x axis. Uh, you plot your two points. So we had the y intercept was zero, negative three, one, two, uh, sorry, negative three, zero. So that would be this order pair. You have the y intercept of zero, negative two. So I go two down on the y axis. I plot that point. I'm going to label it. That's our zero, negative two. And now lastly, just draw a line that is decreasing. Uh, so let's see how straight my line comes. See, my line doesn't come out straight, but thanks to this, it sort of helped me out. Oh, you know what? I can use a ruler. See, the good thing is you don't have to worry about this on my lab. My lab, it sort of helps you with sketching the line. Um, but by hand, my line always come out crooked. It's like one of those messed up hair lines. But that's your equation of the line. Okay, so I'm gonna zoom out. And that's all of problem five. The graph is on the bottom right. You plot your two order pairs, namely the X and Y intercepts. Then you recognize that the slope was negative. So therefore the line must be decreasing. Is there any questions? Any questions? Okay. Let's look at uh, problem six, or do you guys want me to give you guys another minute or two?
All right. Let's look at problem number six. Now, um, anybody remember what I said about, uh, oh, snap. <laughs> you know, it's funny. When I write, write this problem, I thought my graph was there, but it's not. So let me just formula, uh, quickly create one. So technically speaking, problem six uh, states, write the equation of the line in slope intercept form based on the given graph. So let's say I give you the following order pairs. Let's say that one of the order pairs um, is zero comma eight, and the second order pair is four comma zero, right? And what we wanna do, the goal of this problem is based off of the points that passes through uh, this line, Uh, we're going to write out the equation of this line in slope intercept form. So again, slope intercept form is y equals mx plus b. What you should do in this problem is first figure out what is the slope. In order for you to figure out the slope, all you need to know are two points that lie on that line. Two of the key points that you can use are the intercepts. So, um, if you want to find your slope, go ahead and, and label your intercepts. Uh, that would be your x1, y1, x2, y2, and insert it into the formula. Change in y, y2 minus y1 over the change in x, x2 minus x1, and then you simplify. So y2 was 0, so we have 0 minus 8. Uh, x2 was 4, x1 was 0. This would be 4 minus 0. What's zero minus eight? Negative eight. What is your uh, four minus zero? Four. Negative eight over four is negative two. So we have that m is equal to negative two. Well, with m equals negative two, I can directly substitute that into our slope intercept form. And there's something else I, can, I, I, could, uh, I could also substitute. Right, I know that M is, is negative two, but do we know the value of B? Yeah, B, which is your Y-intercept is eight. So you take these two values and you've inserted into your formula uh, for slope intercept. You're gonna get Y equals negative two X plus eight. And that will be your solution, All right? So based on the graph, I'm sorry, I should have had the graph there. I thought it was. Um, but all you got to do is just identify two points that lies on the line. Namely, uh, choose the, one of the points being your y-intercept because that would automatically find, uh, tell you what the value of b is. b was eight. When you choose another point, let's say like the x-intercept, you calculate your slope, insert both m and b into your formula and end of story. You're done. Now, I did make this comment earlier. What did I say about questions that are highlighted in yellow? It's gonna be, where, where else would you, if it's not on your first exam, where else would it possibly be? No, no, if it's not on your first exam, on the final, that's right, okay? So all these problems that I have highlighted in yellow, please make sure you save it because again, they're gonna be perfect problems to review for the final. That's right. Thank you, Raphael. Okie dokes. I think this one out of, the, out of the six problems we've done so far, I think this one uh, and the one where we had to write the equation in circle in standard form, I think those were the two easiest, right? If you had to give like a rating of easy versus hard, I think these two are the easiest. The next one, problem number seven is also highlighted in yellow. And it's a problem that, that gives students mo um, uh, a lot of trouble. So, I'm gonna show you two different problems. There's a part A and a part B. Part A, we're gonna deal with parallel lines, I think, and part B, we're gonna do with perpendicular. Okay, so problem seven states, use the, uh, use the given conditions to write an equation for each line in point slope and slope intercept form. Uh, part A talks again about parallel lines versus part B, we're dealing with perpendicular lines. 
So if two lines are parallel, what do we know about their slopes? The same, right? So these are just a couple of definitions slash formulas we should know. If uh, two lines, oops, L1 and L2, those are the names I'm gonna give my lines. If, L1, if two lines, L1 and L2 are parallel, then uh, their slopes are the same. Equivalently, that's M1 is equal to M2. Now, on the other hand, if two lines are perpendicular, uh, let's call those lines L1 and L2 are, sorry. If two lines L1 and L2 are perpendicular, then what do we know about their slopes? That's right, negative reciprocals. So equivalently, uh, that means that if you know the value of M1, then M2 will be uh, the negative reciprocal of it, right? So M1 is equal to negative, uh, one over M2. Okie dokes. So these are the definitions that we will use for both parts A and B. So if you look at this, I have, uh, I, it's crazy. I, I, I remember to list workspace for problem seven A and B, but for problem six, I forget the graph. All right. So, all right, no, no big deal. Let's work with part A. So on part A, you have a line that's passing through the given order pair. So you have an order pair, which is negative one, six, and is parallel to the line two X plus five Y equals eight. So we have that line one and line two are parallel. And that let's just say for the purpose of demonstration, line one is, uh, the given equation, 2x plus 5y equals 8. What we want to do is find L2. Okay, so there's a few steps that we have to do. First, look at line 1. Is line 1, which is 2x plus 5y equals 8, written in slope-intercept form? No, so we have to write it in the slope-intercept form. There's no other way about it. So for part A, what we're going to do is first uh, rewrite line one in slope intercept form. So the equation was 2x plus 5y equals 2, 8. All right, how do I write this out in slope intercept form? Subtract two X on both sides. So the two X on the left would cancel out. You're gonna get five Y is equal to negative two X plus eight. What comes next? Divide five on both sides. Now, when I divide five on both sides, the fives on the left cancel out. But will the fives, uh, when we divide negative two X or negative two and the positive eight by five, will it simplify any further? Meaning, can we reduce those fractions? Sorry about that. No, we cannot. So we just leave it alone. We say negative two over five X plus eight over five. Okay, now after you did the rewrite, you can go ahead and identify both the slope of line one and the slope of line two based on the condition that the two lines are parallel. All right, so now, Determine L1, uh, sorry, M1 and M2.
So what is the value of M1? Negative two, five. The value of M2, negative two, five. Again, the two lines are parallel, so they have the same slope, right? M1 is gonna be equal to M2. Now we move on to the third step. The third step states that um, we are going to write the equation in point slope form. When we write the equation in point slope form, be sure to use the value of M2 and your given point. It kind of doesn't matter with parallel lines because the slopes are the same anyways. But when you, get with per when you get to perpendicular lines, it matters that you use M2. Just want to point that out. Uh, so we're using M2 is equal to negative 2, 5, and um, the order pair negative 1, 6. Okie dokes. You can go ahead and plug things in. So the point slope form was Y minus Y1 equals to M times X minus x1. We have y minus 6 equals um, negative 2 over 5 times x minus negative 1. So the first thing that you have to do on my lab is to make sure that you simplify uh, the point slope form. When you simplify the point slope form or, or condense it just a tad bit, wherever you have two negatives, turn it into a positive. Where do we have two negatives in this equation? Say it louder. X minus negative one. So the X minus negative one, you're gonna convert that to X plus one. So again, first thing on my lab is to simplify the point slope form. That's Y minus six equals negative two over five times X plus one. And that would be the solution for the point slope form. That's your solution. But unfortunately, we're not finished. After you have the point slope form, you then convert it to the slope intercept form, right? So lastly, um, I'm sorry for those that are in the, Zoom meet, uh, in the Zoom meeting, I'm just gonna zoom in a bit so I, I can write out this nicely. So lastly, convert point slope into slope uh, intercept form. And we saw how to do this earlier. All you gotta do is solve for y. So we picked up from where we left off. We have y minus six equals negative two over five times x plus one. You use the distributive property uh, to take the, the slope and distributing it inside the parentheses. This will become y minus six equals negative two over five x. What's negative two over five plus times one? That's negative two fifths. And how can I get the uh, y by itself? That's right, we're gonna add six on both sides. All right. So this will give us y, the sixes will gone. Uh, they're gone on that left, on the left-hand side. You have negative two over five x minus two over five plus six. Now, can I add negative two over five plus six the way it's being presented? And unfortunately, no. What do we do first? If I wanna add the negative two fifth to the positive six. You gotta find a least common denominator. Can I find the least common denominator if six is written the way it is? No, first got to convert it as a fraction. If you write six as a fraction, it's going to be six divided by what number? Six divided by? I can't hear you guys. One, yes, six divided by one. All right, so look at your denominators now. Your denominators are five and one. What is the LCD, your least common denominator? Five, that's right. This common denominator is five. So the first fraction, negative two fifth already have that denominator five, there's nothing to do with it. But look at six over one. If you change the denominator to five, 
then you also have to change the numerator. One times five gives us five. So six times five will give us 30. Okay, now we're ready to put the final answer together. So the final answer should be y equals negative two over five x, right, sorry. It should be negative two fifth times x. So please note that x is not in the denominator. Uh, what's negative two fifth plus uh, 30 over five now? Say it again. Yep, plus 28 over 20, uh, 28 over five. And that would be your final answer. Negative two fifth X plus uh, 28 over five. Sorry, I squeezed it in there in the bottom, but that will be your final solution. It's a, say it again. That's a slope intercept form because you can clearly identify your slope and your Y intercept. By the way, one way of checking that your answer is valid, uh, look at this equation that I put the box around versus uh, the equation from the, in, from, the, from the very first step. They both have the same slope, right? Which indicates that they have parallel slopes. But more importantly, look at the y-intercept. Are the y-intercepts the same? Look at the equation that we begin with. That was for line one versus the equation that I put the box on. Do they have the same uh, y-intercept? Yes or no? No, they don't. So two lines are parallel if they have the same slope, but more importantly, they don't intercept. So as long as they have different y-intercepts, you know that one line, uh, both these lines are not exactly the same. They're two different lines. Any questions? Zoom in? Sure. I'll zoom in on the last two steps. You gotta speak louder. In the box, y equals negative two over five times x plus 28 over five. Sounds good. Check the chat real quick. Sure, I'm going to zoom out. It's okay if I zoom out back. Sorry about it. I didn't expect that to call me. It was my bad on this one. I could have been a little bit more organized. I think that was Yasmin that asked me. Uh, Yasmin, are we good? Okay, okay, guys. Uh, anybody else? Any last minute questions regarding this one? Take a picture. You guys should be copying this because you're going to be learning how to, you got to be expected to solve something similar. By writing it, it helps with, with memorization. It sort of builds the memory. Okay. Uh, let's do problem number 7B. So 7B, uh, we have that the line is passing through negative three, two. So here's the order pair, negative three, two, that was given. Um, we have that it's perpendicular to the line Y equals one third uh, of X plus seven. So 
L1 and L2 are perpendicular. And you have that L1 uh, is given, is defined as Y equals uh, one third of X plus seven. Now this problem is gonna be a little tad shorter for us because look at line one. Is line one written in, in y equals mx plus b form? Yes, it is. Can you clearly identify your slope? Yes. If you can clearly identify the slope, then we should be able to find the slope of our second line. So for this problem, um, we can go ahead with finding m1 and m2. What is the value of M1? What is your given slope? One over three. And what is the value of M2 now? You know that the two lines are perpendicular. So they have negative, the slopes are negative reciprocals of each other. Yeah? Say it louder. That's right. If you take the flip of one over three, it's three over one. And because M1 was positive, then that implies M2 is negative. So negative three over one is just negative three. Okay. So now we go, we can proceed to using the point slope form. Using point slope form, uh, sorry. We're up to point slope form using m2 is equal to negative three and the given uh, order pair, which was negative three comma two. All right, so you insert it into your formula. You got y minus y1 equals to m times x minus x1. And you apply a little bit of direct substitution. Uh, you get y minus two equals to negative three times x minus negative three. And then you, you simplify this just a tad bit. You condense it by combining any two negatives wherever it's located. Uh, do we have two negatives next to each other? Yes, where? x minus the negative three, so that becomes x plus three. So in point slope form, it's y minus two equals negative three times x plus three. That's point slope form done. Now we just do the slope intercept. So for the slope intercept, we have y minus two equals negative three times x plus three. You do a little bit of direct substitution. Uh, sorry, not direct substitution. You distribute the negative three from your slope into the parentheses. That will give us negative three x minus nine, and then you add two to both sides. If you add two to both sides, you get y equals negative three x, um, and then minus negative nine plus two is what? Negative seven. So y is equal to negative three x minus seven. Any questions to seven B? This one again was a little bit shorter for us, given the fact that the, uh, the two lines here, uh, sorry, line one was already written in um, slope intercept form. And then we find it's uh, the value of M2, it turned out to be a negative integer. We didn't have to worry about dealing with any fractional uh, arithmetic or any arithmetic that involves fractions. For finding, we got negative three because we took the negative reciprocal of, of one third. So if you take the flip of one third, it becomes negative three. Negative three over one, and negative three over one reduces negative three. Any other questions? All right, let's continue. All right, so problems. 
three through seven there was all about uh, lines. Problem eight all the way to the bottom, problem 16 is on functions, okay? Um, let's see how far we can go. Uh, what I'll try to do is, I know some of you, you probably uh, want to leave, but I'll stay here till 6.30. So I'll do like another hour more of review. And hopefully that will be a good solid review for everyone, okay? So problem eight states, give the domain and range for each relation, then determine whether each relation is a function. Now, when we talk about relations, relation is just a set that contains uh, order pairs, x comma y. So for part A, can we determine the domain and the range for that relation? What will be our domain? What is the value? Yeah, it's going to be what? Say it louder. It's going to be all the x. When we say x, are we talking about the first or the second component of the order pair? The first component. So what are the values that should go into the, our set that belongs for the domain? One, two, three, and four. That's right. What about the range? Well, here's the thing. We have the numbers seven, three, five appearing twice. A set, uh, in general, when you're dealing with a set, um, it, it must be well-defined and the ordering of your set doesn't matter, as long as we know the objects that belongs to that set. So we have the number seven, we have the number three, but because the number five appeared twice, do I need to write it out two times? No, just write it out once. So my question now is based off of our two sets for the domain and range, is this relation a function? Yes or no? You guys are nodding your head yes, why? Can you explain? Yeah? Exactly one y value, that's right. So each of, the, each of your x values was sent or hit to exactly one value from the range. So the answer is yes. This relation is a function because uh, each input value from the domain was sent to exact or was assigned to exactly one value from the range. <laughs> All right, end of story for problem A. Let's look at part B. Again, we're going to do the same thing. We want to identify our domain, then our range. So what values, when you look at part B relation, would be uh, going into the set that, invo uh, that involves our domain? One, two, and three. That's all the first components. So. Because two is repeating itself, do I need to write it out twice? No, just one time. So it's one, two, three. What about the range? Two, three, four, and seven. Okay. So you can sort of do like a little diagram here to determine if this is a relation or not. Uh, if this relation is a function. We had that one was sent to two. We had that two was sent to three. We have that two was also sent to four and that three was sent to seven. So is this relation a function? Yasmin says no. Anybody can explain why? The answer is no, by the way, but why? Not two domains, but two what? The values that go inside the domain, they're called what? Starts with an I. Inputs, they're inputs. So no, this relation is a, uh, is not. 
a function. And it's precisely because of the idea of that, look at your two, look at your one input value. You had one input value that was sent to how many values in the range? Two, All right? So no, this relation is not a function because one input value was assigned to two output values. So it violates, it pretty much violates our definition of a function, right? The function is just three things. It's composed of your domain, it's composed of your range, and it's a rule that sends exactly one input value to exactly, uh, assigned it to exactly one output value, violates that definition. Any questions to problem number eight? That's right. Good to go. We can move on to problem number nine. All right, so <coughs> problem nine states, determine whether each of the equation uh, defines Y as a function of X. Anybody know how to do this algebraically? How to determine that Y is a function of X? Yeah, solve for Y, that's right. So in each of these problems, we're gonna solve for y. All right, so let's look at part A. For part A, we have the equation 5x minus y is equal to 8. So if I solve for y, there's two things I have to do. First, I must do what? <laughs> Subtract 5x, that's right. So this will give us negative y is equal to negative 5x plus 8. What is the next step? Yes, divide by negative 1. So if you divide negative 1 on both sides, you get y equals 5x minus 8. This is a linear equation. Now, does this equation uh, defines y as a function of x? Yes or no? I'll give you a hint. Think of your definition of a function. It's a rule that, that signs exactly one input value. Oh, well, I'm still going to get skewed by the way. I'm still going to go. I, I'm still, I'm still going to go on. I'm still continuing my review. I know that it's, it's about to be close to 540. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm going on to like 630-ish. Okay. So, um, looking at this equation, y equals 5x minus 8. Um, I'm just going to zoom up a little bit until that clears up. All right, there we go. Um, is this a... Is y a function of x here? Yes or no? And how can you how can you explain it? You have to speak a little louder. That's right. That's right. For each value of x you're always gonna get back one value of y, all right? So in short, I'm gonna say yes, it satisfies the definition of a function. It has two variables. The inputs are x, the outputs uh, comes from the variable y, and it's gonna be a rule, right? 
the equation as a rule that signs exactly one input value to exactly one output value. So part A is good. Let's look at part B. What you want to check for again is the definition. If it ever violates your definition, then the answer will automatically be no. So for part B, we have 5x squared plus y equals 7. All right, what do I do in order to solve this equation? Minus the 5x squared on both sides. If I subtract 5x squared on both sides, this becomes y equals 7 minus 5x squared. For this problem, now, uh, will y represent x, or, or, or sorry, is for this equation, is it defined where y as a function of x? Yes or no? Not too sure if anybody was speaking in the chat, but I couldn't hear you. Or in the Zoom. What do you guys think? Does it violate? Do you see this definition getting violated? If I take one value of x, will it give me multiple values of y? No. Yes or no? Start small. If I plugged one into this equation, okay. then what's seven minus five times one squared? Yeah? That's right, but, but here's the thing though. It states that you can have, it's, you're allowed to have multiple inputs, like one and negative one, that goes to one output. That's allowed. Like for example, we show that in problem 8a, where you have a, multi, uh, um, a value like three and four from the input values that was set to five, that's okay. My question is, will we ever get to violate our definition? Will there be an input value? Can you think of any? that will give us, uh, for one input, two output values, or at least two? Yes or no? Say again? Remember, the, the negative five is not being squared, only the x's. So the long story short to this problem is the answer is um, yes. Y is a function of x. Y is satisfied the definition of a function. From an algebraic standpoint, right? Now I'll show it the, the, the example where it's not in part C. I give that one away, but look at the y here. Is there anything next to your y in your equations when you rewrote it? In other words, did it include any absolute value, any square root? Did it include any plus or minus? No, there was only um, uh, just a y by itself. In particular, for every, um, for every input value that you have here, um, you're always gonna get back exactly one output. But sometimes when you have something like the plus and minus, which I'll show you in a second, sometimes it would yield where if you plug in one input value, it gives you two outputs. And that's, that's shown in part C. So part C, let's go. We have X plus Y squared is equal to nine. We wanna solve for Y. So if I wanna solve for Y in this example, what should I do first? Subtract the X. If I subtract X on both sides, X on the left is canceled. You're gonna get Y squared is equal to nine minus X. Now, how do you get the Y by itself? Ooh, we have a Y squared, huh? Can't divide because technically speaking, uh, what is the coefficient in front of the Y squared? It's a one, so you can't divide by one. 
will be pointless. But how can I get that squared away from the y? You take the square root. Here's the thing though, here's the catch. And I'll show you with a small, with a, with a different example real quick. So let's just look at this example on the side so we can understand this idea. Let's say if I had x squared is equal to nine, then what would be the value of x? Three, right? Because three squared is nine, right? So one value of x should be three. Can you think of another value? Say it louder, negative three. You see X is gonna equal to also negative three because negative three squared still gives us nine. Anytime you multiply two negatives, it's always positive. So when I apply my square root on both sides, just please note that next to the square root of the nine minus X, there should be a plus or minus directly to its left, right? So in other words, the square root of Y squared is just Y. That's now going to equal to plus or minus the square root of nine minus X. Here's an example where Y is no longer a function of X. And all we can do uh, to, to show that this is actually true is one counter example. One counter example that shows that it doesn't satisfy the definition of a function. Let's choose a value of X, right? Let's say X was equal to zero and you plug it into that equation, right? You plug it into this equation. This becomes Y equals plus or minus the square root of nine minus zero. But what is nine minus zero? Nine, what's the square root of nine? Three, so we get plus or minus square root of nine, which is plus or minus three. If you notice, when X is equal to zero, how many solutions do you have? You have two solutions. Either X, either Y could have been positive three or Y could be negative three. Therefore, it violates your definition. How's that? Any questions to problem nine? So in short, if you don't see this plus or minus, oops, sorry. When you solve uh, the given equation for, uh, in terms of y, if you don't have that plus and minus, namely you don't have to use that square root property, um, then you're most definitely, most likely gonna get a, a function. Now, if you have that plus or minus there, then oops, you're in trouble. You're in trouble. Somebody asked to show 7B. I'll show it real quickly. Um, when you're finished with, I guess, taking a picture or a screenshot, can you just say thank you? So I know that you got it. Yes, I got it. Alrighty. Back to nine. Sounds good? Okay, we move on to problem 10. Okay, I'm gonna be moving on to problem number 10 now. So for problem number 10, it states given f of x equals two x squared minus five x plus eight, we're gonna compute the following. So we're computing functional values here. So what are your inputs in, the, in this example, in this problem? Can somebody identify your inputs? Three, negative three, negative X, X plus H. Those are all your inputs. Your, wherever you see an X in your function, you're going to replace it with those input values. Now, how many times does X appear in the given function? Twice, so you have to make two substitutions. All right, so let's do the computation. For f of three, that's going to be two times three squared minus five times three plus eight. So what's three squared? Nine, uh, nine times two is 18. 
What's negative five uh, times three? Negative 15 plus eight. So we worked this out. What's uh, 18 minus 15? Three, three plus eight, 11, done. Let's look at f of negative three. Well, this is gonna be two times negative three squared minus five times negative three plus eight. Negative three squared is what again? Nine, nine times two is 18. Uh, what's negative five times negative three? Positive 15 plus eight. So you add the three numbers, 18, 15, and eight are what? No, 18 and 15 is 18 plus 15. Let's start with that. I know we did a lot of math today. Say again. Yes, your final answer should be 41. 18 plus 15 is, is uh, 33. 33 plus eight is 41. Okay. So when we get to part uh, C and D, basically computing F of negative X and F of X plus H, we're doing the same thing. Wherever you see an X, you're making a replacement with the given input value. The input value for the next one is negative X. So replace X with negative X and simplify. That will be two times negative X squared minus five times negative X plus eight. What happens when you take negative X squared? Say it louder. It's positive x. So it's positive x squared. This, so you get 2x squared. Negative 5 times negative x. Positive 5x. And uh, plus 8. Can I combine any more like terms? No. So my answer for part C is 2x squared plus 5x plus 8. And we're done. Alrighty, now we get to the good stuff. We get to part D. Part D is where it gets very interesting. This is one that I think, you know, when, it, when you were in elementary school and you were learning how to spell words, they were, your teacher, elementary teacher, was telling you to write the words like five times, 10 times, 15 times, etc. Practice doing this one like five times, 10 times, 15 times, you will get used to it, guaranteed. So if you have to do f of x plus h, wherever you see an x, you now replace it with a binomial, x plus h. So this becomes 2 times x plus h squared minus 5 times x plus h plus 8. Okay, so there's a couple of ways that you can go about simplifying x plus h squared. I'll show you the longer way, and then I'll show you the shortcut way. Right, so I'll do this on the side. The longer way, if you want to expand x plus h squared, that means that you have the binomial times itself. So you can rewrite it as x plus h times x plus h. And then you, if, when, once you have a binomial times a binomial, you can use, anybody know what's the name of the method? The, it's an extended version of the distributive property. It starts with an F, it's called FOIL. Thank you, Yasmin. FOIL means that you keep the first, uh, sorry, keep the first term. You multiply the first terms together. So you take X times X, which is X squared. Uh, then you take uh, the outer terms, X times H. That's just XH. Then you can take H times X, which by the way is X times H still. And h times h is h squared. And then you combine like terms. Uh, the terms that you combine are the middle terms. How many copies of xh's do we have? 2xh. So it's x squared plus 2xh plus h squared. So I, I, I found x plus h squared here by using the FOIL method. That's just one way of doing it. The other way about it is to use what we call perfect uh, square trinomials. 
if you have, let's say, a plus b squared or a minus b squared, this is equal to the first term squared plus two times the value of your first and second term plus the last term squared. If you had a minus sign between the a and b in your binomial, then the only difference is that the 2ab now becomes a negative. So it's a squared minus 2ab plus b squared. So if you use the idea of the perfect square trinomial, you square the first term, which is x. So that's x squared. Uh, you take two times the value of those terms, two times x times h is 2xh. And you square the last term. Last term was h, h squared. So if you apply that perfect square trinomial, it still give you x squared uh, plus 2xh plus h squared. All right, so let me just write that out. Don't worry, you're gonna see this again, trust me. Minus five eight, five times x plus h plus eight. Okay, if you wanna continue this off, make sure you use the distributive property now. You're gonna do it twice. You're gonna distribute the two inside the parentheses. Then you're gonna distribute the uh, negative five inside the parentheses. This will give us the following. We'll get 2x squared plus 4xh plus 2h squared minus 5x minus 5h plus 8. If you look at your terms now being expanded, uh, can we combine any like terms here? Is there any terms that we can combine together? Nope. So that would have been the final answer uh, for problem. Uh, 10, where you're computing f of x plus h. Any questions? Okay. Are you ready for problem 11? Give you a minute. Wait, something happened? I have messages. Oh, I'm supposed to take a photo of you. It's okay if I can have the consent to take a photo. I'm just going to take a photo of the back. We're all good. Go on to problem 11. All right, so problem 11, I don't think you guys have covered that particular problem yet in your class. Um, but I just want to show you the basic computations of it because later on in your course, you're going to learn how to sketch their graph. They're called the piecewise function. Piecewise functions are, in short, equations that are separated by uh, specified domains. So if you want to do the computation, like for example, f of negative five, you look at the, your domains, right? these are your domains, and you see which one of the domains is satisfied. Whichever domain it satisfies, then you will take that value of x and plug it into one of the equations. So if you want to compute f of negative five, which equation uh, will, I, will I make a substitution for? The first one, the second one, or the third? The first one, right? Because the domain for the first equation is whenever x is less than or equal to negative two. 
Is negative five less than or equal to negative two? Yes, it is. So f of negative five is equal to four minus five times negative five. All right, you work this out. You do the negative five times negative five first. Uh, that's going to be what? Negative five times negative five. 25, 25 plus four. 20 what? 29, that's right. Four plus 25, which is 29. And you're done. Now, f of five, uh, which equation will that satisfy? Uh, or where, or sorry, which one of your domains will it satisfy? The first domain, the second domain, or the third domain? The second domain, well, is five less than, well, sorry, is five greater than negative two, but less than positive two? No, five is definitely not less than two. So you can't use the second equation. Um, what other choice we have? Yeah, the third one, yes. Is five greater or equal to two? Yes, it is. So you would plug five into your third equation. So it's five squared plus three. So what is uh, five squared? 25, 25 plus three, 28. The next one's here to trick you, but you're, it's really not uh, to trick you. You just gotta figure it out. You have F of negative 1.58792. I just copied whatever, whatever numbers came to mind. All right. So which one of your domains does it satisfy? The first domain, the second domain, or the third domain? The second domain. The second domain, yes. Uh, negative two is less than negative 1.58792, which is still less than positive two. And what is the equation for the second domain? What is your equation? The number seven. What we basically have there in the middle of this uh, function here, uh, between negative two to positive two, you will have a horizontal line. So it's basically constant. So whatever value of X you plug in, in, in that middle domain, you're always gonna get back to number seven. So if I take this value that I have, which is there to deceive you, your answer is gonna be seven. That's right. Any questions? See if any questions are in the chat. We're almost done. You know, you got 12, 13, 14, 15, 16. Five more problems. Can I continue? Oh, you see, negative 1.58792 is satisfied the second domain. But since the second equation is just the number seven, no matter what value x you plug in, you're going to get seven. So if I use zero, the answer is seven. If I use one, I'm sorry, if I use one, it's still seven. If I use 1.5, it's seven. Okay. All right. Now, again, what did I say about the questions highlighted? They're going to be on the, on the final. So 12, 13, 15, and 16, they're all highlighted. They're all questions that are on the final. I would like to wrap up our, our, today, our review session today by going over them. So problem 12 says to compute f of x, sorry, given f of x is equal to two x squared minus five x plus eight, it's a function that we have already saw, already encountered, uh, compute and simplify the difference quotient. So we need to know the formula for the difference quotient. It's unclear whether or not on my lab that this formula is given to you. So please make sure that you know it. The, the formula for the difference quotient is as follows. It's f of x plus h minus f of x all divided by h, as long as h is not zero, right? Because you should have learned with functions so far, namely with you're dealing with limited domains, you can't divide by zero. Okay, so first, you compute 
f of x plus h. But did we already compute f of, f of x plus h? Did they compute this before? Anyone? Did I compute f of x plus h? Uh, oh, right. The answer to that is yes, we did. If you look back at problem number 10, we already know exactly, was it 10? Yes. If you look at problem number 10, we've already computed it. That's what's in that box. So I'm just going to use that answer. So if you were to work out the arithmetic, you get, again, 2x squared plus 4xh plus h squared, uh, 2 h squared, minus 5x, minus 5h, plus 8. Okay, so again, C problem 10. After you compute f of x plus h, you will take it, or uh, basically take its terms, the terms from the original function, and insert it into your formula. So here's how I do it. I like to keep the terms of f of x plus h um, separated from the original, uh, the terms of the original function. I like to put brackets around them. The good thing about it is between the brackets, you'll always have that minus sign. So watch this. We have in the first bracket, 2x squared plus 4xh plus 2h squared minus 5x minus 5h plus 8 minus the original function, 2x squared minus 5x plus 8. So f of x plus h and the f of x terms, they're separated, uh, they're, they're, they're inside their own brackets and they're separated by that minus sign. Because I have that minus sign separating them, I just gotta look for the whatever terms they have in common and get rid of it, right? So what is one term that you can see that they have in common? The 2x squared. So 2x squared minus itself is going to be zero. That's gone. What else is gone? What else can we say bye-bye t? The, the negative 5x, yes. And the positive 8. If you look at this closely, all the terms of the original function will essentially cancel out, okay? All the terms of the original function will cancel out. The only terms that you will have remaining in the numerator are the terms that has an H in it. So that's essentially doing the difference part. Now we've got to do the quotient part. The quotient part is just fancy way of just saying that we're simplifying this. So look at your numerator. Since all the terms have an H, what can I do? You can factor it out. So if we factor the H out, we got 4X plus 2H minus 5 over H. Now, as long as H is not zero, the H's are canceled. And whatever is remaining inside the parentheses is your final answer. 4X plus 2H minus 5. Any questions? Problem 12? Oh, if you look at the formula, it says minus f of x. f of x is the original function. It's 2x squared minus 5x plus 8. Good question. Any other questions? Sorry. Is it me or that AC didn't feel like it was working at all? It never works? I'm not.
Can we continue on going forward? All right, let's look at problem 13. Have you guys talked about limited domains of functions? No, you haven't? No, you're shrugging your shoulder. No, not at all. I haven't talked about limited domains. Well, we can talk about it briefly here. When you want to state the domain of one function divided by another, you must consider the domain of both functions. Fortunately for us, the domain of f of x and g of x, in words, we can say it's all real numbers, okay? Both their domains. However, when you're dealing with the division, f of x divided by g of x, there's just one special condition. There's, when, when you think about a fraction, what number can we not divide by? We cannot divide by zero. So for, for some value of x, that denominator, g of x, cannot be equal to zero. Okay. So let's simplify this. You're welcome. Uh, let me show you how you simplify and state your domain. Uh, so since you guys haven't really saw this uh, as much, I'll try to break down as much as I can, but try to stay within my time. So if you look at f of x, it was equal to x minus seven and g of x was equal to x squared minus 49. Now, as a rational expression, as a fraction, try to write these uh, terms, if you can, in factor form. For example, x minus seven, can you factor anything or can you factor it uh, any further? No, x minus seven, uh, the greatest common factor of that numerator is just one. So you leave it alone. All right, so I'll write in a, in a set of parentheses here. If you look at your denominator, x squared minus 49, can you write the denominator in the factor form? Yeah, right, that's, that's what? Uh-huh, the, the factoring technique that you used, by the way, was called what? Difference of two perfect squares. Okay, so now look at your denominator. It's x minus seven, x plus seven. There are some problematic inputs there. There are some values of x that makes the denominator zero, right? Look at x minus seven. What can I take away from seven? So that way that first expression, x minus seven, uh, become a zero, right? In other words, if I take x minus seven, set it equal to zero, if I solve for x, what do we get? We're going to get x equals 7. So if x was 7, 7 minus 7 is 0. 0 minus whatever times whatever is still 0. Is that a bad thing? Yes, it is, because you can't divide by 7. All right, look at the other expression. If you have x plus 7 is equal to 0, then that implies x is equal to what value? If you were to solve for that equation, yeah? Negative seven. So we have two problematic inputs. X cannot be equal to seven and X cannot be equal to negative seven. Uh, more importantly, we wanna also simplify this function. When you're simplifying functions, um, the original function, whatever domain issues the original function has, the simplified version will also have the same domain issues, okay? So I'm running out of room uh, to write things out, but just keep that in mind. Whatever your original function is, the simplified version will still have the same domain issues. The domain issues basically carry over, okay? It keeps on uh, continuing. So and when you look at the expression, x minus seven over x minus seven times x plus seven, you can simplify it. We can get rid of a common binomial factor, namely the x minus seven. You have a one in the placeholder for the numerator. So it's one over x plus seven, but just be mindful that the domain issues of the original function carries over. If you wanna state your domain, let's say in words, you say that the domain of f over g, that's the names of our functions, f over g is all real numbers.
except when x is equal to negative seven, uh, plus or minus seven. And that's it. Um, I could talk a little bit more about interval notation, but I'll wait until your instructor covers it. Then when we do a, a second review, right? When I do a second review session, let's say the second review session, I'll show you how to do the interval notation, okay? Right, here is just pretty much some, some questions that I like you guys to at least see before actual class. Sure, you guys Okay, so this is problem 13. Uh, let's look at problem 14, right? So problem 13 and 14, we're looking at functions that have limited domains. So here we have the square root function. We have find the domain of h of x equals the square root of 20 minus 4x. So let's have something in its comparison. Let's look at f of x equals square root of x first. In pre-calculus, the only number system, uh, the number system that we work with here is the real number system, okay? We work with the real number system. What does that imply about f of x equals square root of x? Well, what type of values of x can I plug in and get a real number? Say again? Four, yeah. Four is what type of number, by the way? Is it a positive? Is it a negative? Four is not negative. Four is positive. Sorry. You can plug in positive numbers inside the square root and get back a real number. Can you plug in zero and get back a real number? Well, what's the square root of zero? Zero. So you do to get back a real number. Can you take the square root of negative numbers? Like negative one, negative two? No. Square root of negative numbers are imaginary. They belong in the complex number system. That belongs to my best friend named Raphael. They're imaginary. No, I'm just kidding. Um, so, uh, long story short, when you're trying to find the domain of square root functions, the radicand, the expression that's inside of the square root, like for example, x, it must always be greater or equal to zero. So in the example that we have, problem 14, finding the domain of h of x equals the square root of 20 minus 4x, you take the, uh, the expression, the algebraic expression, 20 minus 4x, set it greater or equal to zero to figure out what your domain is going to be, right? You actually have to solve an inequality. So let's write it up. We have 20 minus 4x must be greater or equal to zero. All right, so how can I solve this inequality? What should I do first? So track. Yeah, subtract 20 on both sides. So if I subtract 20, the 20s on the left are gone. This will give us negative 4x is greater or equal to negative 20. Now, if I uh, want to solve for, if I want to get the x by itself, what do I do? Say again. Well, that what does that expression read? Is it negative four uh, plus x, or is it negative four times x? You're gonna have to divide. Yes. So if I divide by negative four on both sides, the negative four will cancel. This will give us X. Negative 20 over negative four, by the way, is positive five. But anytime you multiply or divide by a negative number, what happens to your inequality symbol? It changes. So if, if the original inequality sign is greater or equal to, then the new inequality sign will read what? Less than or equal to, that's right. So essentially, as an expression, an algebraic expression as an inequality, that's your domain, right? We say that uh, for problem 14, domain of H is all real numbers such that 
x is less than or equal to five. That's the domain in words. Here's what it looks like visually. Oops, sorry. Let's say that if this was our uh, picture to represent our domain, you locate five on the number line. Because the five was included, you use a, a, a uh, closed dot or a closed or shaded circle. And since it's pointing to the left, the inequality symbol, the less than, then your line uh, should also go to the left. That's a visual representation. Um, using what we call interval notation, it looks something like this. Now, again, you guys, some of you haven't seen this, but when you do, um, when you're reading out interval notation, you read it left to right, namely for your domain. So if I'm starting all the way at the left, anybody know what's there all the way to the left? Negative infinity. So it's negative infinity comma five. Just note that because infinity or negative infinity is not a real number, it's just a uh, mathematical concept. We use a open parentheses. Sorry, uh, that doesn't look like parentheses. So let me fix it. Oh shit, still doesn't. There we go, better. And because we have the five is included, we use a closed bracket. All right. I'll show you the domain the, in, in terms of interval notation for problem 13, I promise you, when we do our second review session. But yes, this is how you find a domain of functions that are lim have limited domains. For the function that involves a square root, you take the algebraic expression, whatever is inside of the square root, not the entire expression, but inside of the square root, that algebraic expression, set it greater or equal to zero and solve for your variable. On the other hand, for problem 13, when you have one function divided by another, you have problematic inputs whenever the bottom is zero. So you got to find those values out. One way of doing it is by the factoring process. Right? You factor out both the numerator and denominator completely. When you look at your denominator, um, you set both and then you set all of its factors equal to zero and you will solve for x. Okay, that gives you the problematic inputs or the bad guys. Okay, we got two more problems and we're gonna call it a day. Problem 15 and problem 16. Problem number 15 is on N16, they're both on your final exams. We are discussing the transformation, uh, discuss the transformations and sketch the graph of both of these functions, yeah? Go, go ahead. Greater than or equal to yes. How did we do that? You got to figure that, that that part is what that's the rule. Because f of x equals square root of x, the domain of what's always going to be greater than or equal to zero. So same thing applies with the algebraic, any algebraic expression inside the square root. End of the day, when you're about to do some sort of computation, right, the step that's right before the square root or the square root step, inside of it always got to be zero or positive. Anything else, it's imaginary or complex, right? If it's negative. Sounds good? It's just a, a rule we accept. Okay, problem 15 is like playing video games. Anybody like playing video games? Okay, Marwin does, nobody else? Playing. That's good. Uh, so yeah, when you're discussing transformation, uh, it's pretty much like playing a video game. Uh, what we have is a set of rules that tells a function whether or not to go from its anchor point to go up, down, left, right. Um, and then there's some reflection rules. So there are six rules I want to write. And then they're going to show you how it's applied to drawing your graphs. So the first rule states that if you have some function plus the value of C, it implies that we shift the graph C units up. If you have f of x minus c, that means that we shift c units down. If I have f of x 
plus C. Now, this, the way that I'm saying this is uh, written differently. This time, the plus C is attached to your X, okay? And, and the first way I read it, wrote it, this, the plus C is not attached to your X. Uh, F of X plus C means that we shift uh, C units to the right, uh, not the right, to the left. And F of X minus C means that we shift C units to the right. These are basically your shifting rules. It's like a, uh, <clears throat> it's like a video game up, uh, the, the control pad of a video game up, down, left, and right. Okay. Now there are two other rules that we we'll need to know. Uh, there are the reflection rules. Okay. One of the reflection rules states that if you have F uh, sorry, if you have negative outside of the function, negative f of x, that means that you flip the function upside down, right? Reflect in the x-axis. Okay, so you, you'll be flipping in that direction. Uh, if the x is inside, uh, the negative is inside of the function, then you would reflect in the y-axis. Okay. It's another flip, but this time you're not you're reflecting, it's not gonna be upside down, but it's gonna go like right, left, left, right, whatever it is. So we have to discuss the transformation rules here and then sketch that graph, and then we'll sketch the graph for problem 16. Now this function, y equals two minus the square root of x minus one, uh, not square root, the absolute value, my apologies, y equals two minus the absolute value of x minus one. Uh, this function uh, derives from the, fu uh, the function y equals the, the absolute value of x. Anybody know what y equals the absolute value of x looks like? That, you know, or, or its graph? No, that's a parabola. That's right, Yasmin is correct. It's a V, V shape. All right, so I'll put it in quotes. It's a V shape. So when I sketch the graph of Y equals two minus, sorry, the absolute value of X minus one, it should look like a V shape. If it's gonna be upside down, if it's gonna be rotated somehow, I don't know yet until we discuss all the rules. Now, when you do look at Y equals absolute value of x on the Cartesian plane, uh, its anchor point, by the way, is at the origin, right? So I'm just going to sketch that out. If this is your anchor point in blue, which is at the origin, then that's what your v-shape looks like. Okay, so let's discuss all the rules of transformation. We're going to put it all in quotes. Let's first look at the two. Is that two, by the way, positive or negative? It's possible. Is it inside of the uh, absolute value? It's outside of it. So which one of my rules will apply? I didn't write them on as numbers, but which one do you think would apply? The first one, f of x plus c. So what does the plus two tell me to do? Well, that implies that I'm gonna shift two units up. Okay, so that's one of the transformations. Let's look at inside of the absolute value function. It contains a minus one. Because the minus one's inside of it, uh, then we're gonna do what? We're not shifting two limits down, no. Look, look, if you look at the minus one, it's inside of the function, so the fourth rule applies. So minus one tells us that we're gonna shift one unit to the right. So that covers uh, the shifting rules. Let's look at reflection, if any. Now, the equation originally reads y equals two minus the absolute value of x minus one. So we took care of the two, we took care of the minus one. Let's take care of this minus. 
is the minus inside of the absolute absolute value function or is it outside of it? It's where? Inside of the absolute value function, namely this minus. I'll, I'll circle it in red so we don't get confused. That one. The one that's in the middle. Uh, is that inside or outside of the, the one that I circle, is it inside or outside of the absolute value function? It's outside of it. So what does that minus one imply? Or sorry, what does the minus imply? Are we gonna reflect in the x-axis or are we gonna reflect in the y-axis? Look at the way that, look at your notation. Reflect in the x or y-axis. Well, again, look back at the negative that I circled. Right? Was that negative inside or outside of the absolute value function? It was outside of it. Because it's outside of that function um, or outside of the absolute value bar, it's reflect in the x-axis. Yes, Yasmin, you got it. So we reflect uh, in the x-axis. All righty. Now you just, all, all you have to do is use uh, your two shifting rules and your reflection rule. You're combining it all and we sketch our graph. Okay. So first off, our anchor point was originally at the origin. So look at your shifting rules. The shifting rule states that I have to first go two units up then one unit to the right. So what would be the new anchor point? Instead of the origin, what would, what would the new anchor point read as? Yes, it would read as one comma two. So that's the point shown in red. Now, if we have the, ref if we're reflecting in the X axis, what does that tell us now about the shape? Is it a V shape that's opening upwards or downwards? Say it louder. It opened downwards. That's right. So I don't know exactly what the graph looks like per se, meaning I don't, oh, sorry. I don't know. Um, yeah, sometimes you can't really get cute with this. Uh, I don't know exactly what the precise graph looks like, but that's my sketch. If I want to get a little bit more articulate, I could have plugged in some ordered pairs. Mainly I could have plugged in a value to its left and to its right. You see that. Uh, the symmetry will hold, uh, but I'm just gonna omit that for now because of time pressure, okay? Yes, do you feel better with problem 15? Let me know in the chat. Okay, are we good on this? Let's do one more and that will be it. I thank you all for your patience today. So problem 16, discuss uh, the transformation and sketch the graph of y equals the uh, square root of x or square root of x plus two. So first of all, you need to know what the graph, just stay for this one, this one's really short, I promise you. Y equals the square root of x. We just gotta know what its graph looks like. And then we use our transformation. Um, anybody know what the graph of the square root of x looks like? Can you draw it with your fingers? Anybody know? You're trying to draw it with a finger. No, it's not going to be going like that way. It goes like this way instead. So it's like, um, anybody ever went fishing? No, nobody goes fishing here? Well, we had, well no wonder you guys have been You guys have been doing activities. Um, so, just kidding. Um, let's say I drew my axis. Now, technically speaking, we know that the domain for this function y equals the square root of x is x is greater or equal to zero. So your anchor point is also at the origin because square root of zero is zero. And it's like you're about to go fishing. Uh, it's like you're throwing that hook. Right here is y equals the square root of x. Okay, now we just gotta discuss the transformation rules. Well, there's only one thing to really talk about. Is that plus two? In this example, is the plus two inside or outside of the function? Inside of the function, that's right. So if it's inside of the function, uh, which shifting rule applies? The one that where you go up 
or less. If it's inside of the function, we have to use f of x plus c, where you should see this to the left. There's no other shifting rules of, uh, that's, that's required. So from your origin, you move two units, one, two. Your new anchor point is over here, negative two, zero. And then you sketch back, oops, not a line, why did I do that? But another uh, square root function. So here in black is y equals square root of x plus two. And that's it. And you could have also checked that this is legit, by the way. If you look at your expression, x plus two, you set it greater or equal to zero, solve for x, you're gonna get x is greater or equal to negative two. Look at your starting point for your domain and look at the graph. What value of x did you start with? Not two, but negative two. All right, everyone. Thank you all for uh, being here today. Uh, for the first week, uh, whether uh, it's in person, this is our first review session. Don't worry, we have our kinks. I know of it, but hopefully we look forward and, and solve them and we have some more, very more productive workshops. Welcome. Good luck on your exam. You're welcome, you guys. Um, I don't think about that. I think about that. For now, we just come to the last section. All right. Can you guys see that last right? All right, well, okay. Yeah, no, all, all the time. By the way, hey, uh, yeah, no, no worries, Martin. It's a great statement, man. All right, I'm going to end the meeting. Well, I'm going to end it for my end. Thank you all for joining here for this session.